Reminds me a bit of Bob. <laughs> Good morning and a, a very brief welcome from me because we have a senior person in the room who started his role, I think, on Friday, who is now the head of site for CEH in Lancaster. I'd like to introduce to you <laughs> the man you've known for all these years, Simon Smart. Welcome. <laughs> One of the lessons Bob tried to teach me, which I failed at, is to avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's my privilege and honour to welcome you all here uh, on behalf of CH. And, and it is quite special because Bob gave me my job at ITE back um, more years ago than I care to remember. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm still here, so that's, that's something. And um, when I sort of remember um, getting that job, the first time I saw Bob was on television, he had his reactor like sunglasses on, he looked a bit like a kind of kindly mafia boss. <laughs> so, this is an interesting character to work for. Um, and it was, and it turned out to be just that, because as well as having a, an amazing vision of how to measure and monitor change across landscapes, he was also just a really, really nice bloke to work for and a good laugh. <coughs> and so I think I'm sure we will agree the memories we have of him are uh, as an excellent scholar, but just a really, really decent, nice bloke as well. And what's really, I don't know, interesting is that his vision for large scale, long term measurements of landscape change now has come right round to resonating completely with what we term as national capability research, which is funded by our research organisation, the Natural Environment Research Council, and now part of UKRI. And it wasn't kind of always the case, and it had a bit of a rocky ride, that vision. But you know, it's, it's a massive tribute to Bob that he always treated. Um, things quite philosophically. And so I know uh, Rob's gonna talk about his, uh, his fondness for interesting bunch of Spanish, but I always remember him saying to me, agua su la puente, when many of these things happened. And so I think it, it's a real honor to welcome you today and we're gonna have a really nice session and I'm gonna speak a bit uh, as well. And um, I think it's just, it's just great to see so many of you here as well from across Europe. So with that, We'll uh, let the proceedings commence. Cheers, Dave. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, Simon. I think that's your first official role, isn't it? I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> there is a message from sent from the other side. It was sent in 2003. Those of you who were in Darwin may remember this because Bob started his presidency of Ayala for Ayala in 2003 at the Darwin meeting. He never made it, so he sent me with the message from the other side. The message, the top part of it, I think, meets today. Wishing everybody an enjoyable and profitable conference. Keep up the Ayala spirit. Now, having said that, there is one or two small bits of administration before we start. First of all, we've got to try and keep people to time. So I will be trying to time people and holding up the, the sign saying, OK, that's how long you've got. We've also got people who if like three big thank yous. Obviously, the biggest thank you is to you lot for actually traveling and coming here. Thank you to those people who are watching, and I'm hoping you can see me and a picture of Bob on your screens at home. And I hope that, and for the speakers, if we can remain reasonably close to the microphone, and I think they may be able to shout in if they want to. Um, so that <laughs> might happen. <laughs> that might happen. But, the other two thank yous that have to be said now are one to it's not Simon who's paid for this, but it's actually UKCEH who helped by providing all the facilities and also to Ayala UK for actually if you like, sponsoring it. So it's a joint venture and I think both of them should be thanked greatly. As far as I'm aware, we're not going to have a fire practice. So if the fire alarms go, please run around and panic. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, no. It, we should be able to, to continue on with that. So with that, I think if I can welcome up Professor Ralph Youngman, a gentleman who shares the initials with Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you do. Right, if I put your presentation on, Rob, there yeah. you go. So, well, this is Bob's Spanish. Anyone in the past, it was not drunken talking, but it's just his Spanish. And so we, I called the, the, the presentation after his words. 
And it's about Bob's habitats and the way he looked at it. And he showed it you and told you how to do it. And I am not going to, sh to show as less of all the things that I think that will be shown by you. I try just to do his, his way around. This is where we, when we met in the 80s. And now this, yes, in the, in the 80s, beginning of the 80s. And that was here in the, near, uh, near uh, his, his home on the coast. We were going there together and he loved mountains and climbing. So what we did was immediately, oh, well, you have to see everything there. And then that's a, this is a kind of, there's a plant that we should, should find there. So we went there. And of course that was in Grange. And Grange was sense, the place where he lived, where also the Merlewood Institute was, where we met the first time and we had the first meetings. Also with Dave, his, his colleague. <laughs> but this was later. No, that was seven yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this was one of the, the, the walks that we had on 30 September 2012, the walk to the pig and whistle uh, over, the, over the hills and led by Bob and all the colleagues. This is the Spanish and uh, uh, Dutch and all kind of European Swiss, uh, all kinds of European people around. And we also celebrated here his 75th birthday with all people in, it was the pick and whistle, I think, yeah. And so people were there, we were there, and this is the family. So I thought, well, uh, you will see part of the family today and tomorrow. And, uh, this was what was then celebrating the smallest one is his son. <laughs> but they resemble quite well. And we did a lot of work together. In 1992, we were invited to the official visit to the Czech Republic. And you must, must remember 1991 was the year that Czechoslovakia became independent. And in 1992, uh, we had an excursion to the Czech Republic, not knowing that they were planning to separate. So we went to the border of Slovakia and went back. And well, this is one of the, uh, the mountains where we were visiting. And with a European company, including Bob and me, and what we visited was the, the acidification of the landscape there by uh, lignite mining. There's enormous areas of lignite mining there and in the eastern part of uh, Germany. It's stopped now and the landscape, if you drive around there, looks much, much better. We also started, and that was one of the things I like very much. This is the first, this is Moravia, restoring the landscape because there was an enormous wide open land with agriculture and all the uh, landscape elements that are, can be seen there. I don't, I have a point right here, if, if it works. No, this does not work. No, okay. A checking pole, if you can. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I can, pole you see here all these hedgerows, the rest of the landscape is empty. And the farmers there said, well, we want to bring back the landscape of our parents the hedgerows and the, we want to bring back the, the wild species to hunt and to walk and hunt and, and enjoy them. And also we want to bring, bring back the memories in the landscape. And that's what we're do, they're doing there. And we were in one of the part of the, that excursion. And later on, we exported that through, through all of Europe. And now in the uh, European directives, you see the need for planting landscape elements and uh, restoring landscape elements and landscape structures. We also studied the Drover's Road in Spain. These are these lines by the Drover Roads, long roads through Spain, historical roads. And the Spanish were so clever, or at least had the idea, well, maybe we should restore, we should have a part of the ministry taking care of them. 
because these Rover roads are also the history of Spain. They remember to the, uh, the, the, the sheep and the sheep herds that were uh, going from north to south and south to north, depending on the weather, depending on the climate and the weather. Well, that's a good word for now. And it looked like this. You see the Drover Road here, one wall here on this one and one wall there, and that goes north or south, well, depending on which direction you look. And nowadays there are cows, but it used to be sheep, enormous sheep, and they transported all to themselves, but also the flora of Spain through the whole of Spain, because on their, on their, on their wool, there was a lot of uh, spores of uh, and the seeds of the different uh, species. And of course, we worked, we worked a lot. <laughs> and we also had need for lunch, <laughs> a good Spanish lunch. And what was all this always, well, you cannot work without a good lunch. So yeah. there was a lunch. And this is the typical picture where he had to stand. Alvino de la as the la leche de los viejos, and he immediately was prepared to stand next to it, and I took the picture. One of the nice things that we did together also with Mark when he was doing his PhD uh, is the classification. Of, the, of, of Europe, the stratification of Europe, and we made all kinds of uh, uh, zones, and this was a very important Spanish zone where all kinds of climates came together and we looked at it. And it was also, for him, it was also his, his uh, uh, Catarian school uh, excursion every summer. He went there for a number of weeks doing Field work with the students of the of the school. I don't know where it was exactly situated. Charles Mason. Charles Mason. The Charles Mason School. Yeah, and that was where he went. Bob chaired the Yale Congress. He congratulated us and invited everyone, as David said, to this meeting, the twenty fifth uh, uh, Yale Congress in Wageningen. It was a good meeting, it was a nice meeting, and he was chairing it, and he was even with a tie. <laughs> that was a uh, remarkable moment. <laughs> that's, that's why I took the picture. And uh, he also had his family there. Here's Frida, and it's just so. Everyone was there. There was the opening, the starting of the of the events, and we all were happy and had a good uh, event. We had excursions everywhere. We had uh, the European Commission. Uh, Miko, Manager Miko, was from the Commission. Came personally. He was Commissioner then, and he said, "Oh, you know, yeah, yes, I come." And so that's what it is. And so. What we enjoyed, and of course, to do field work, we had to prepare ourselves. And we went with Emilio to the mountains in Italy, and had a, a week excursion, learning, uh, seeing how things should be done, and then we were preparing for uh, for the different European projects. But the normal work was, of course, in mm. South Spain. You see, he's indicating the size of the glass. You want? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the the work that we were going to do. This is uh, Ebone, and there are people from all Europe. And he, what he did, he explained. He told you this, this, this. You have to do it that way, and there we have to go. And this was the group for Yvonne. That was a very important one because there we, uh, we brought together all the knowledge that came from the countryside survey, from the European project that we did before, 
and we brought it together into a common European project. Uh, many of you might recognize themselves here, a little bit younger than the night now, but okay. And it was also tiring because in, in France, it was, it was in the south of France, it was hot and everyone was sitting there and everyone, ah, well, except Bob, <laughs> they were reading the text what should be done. <laughs> and in the end, results were discussed. And well, we, we saw the nice computers that they had, field computers that they had here in the UK. And we said, well, we need one as well. And uh, uh, the, our French colleagues went to develop one. And so we did it on, uh, on a simple programming. And uh, we had results and we published them. So as at the bottom end, you see the standardized procedure of surveying and monitoring European habitats and the species. And this was the unified Field observation. Can we get that uh, screen available? No, no. no so unless it's in the end, so let me just. No, oh, okay. I can just come in, squeeze in, yeah. give you for a second. It may be. Uh, I'll yeah, just yeah, have no. a look at the chat anyway, because it might be somebody saying they can't hear. Great. Great. Oh, that's <laughs> that's okay. okay. We can just minimize that. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay, and it's good. gone. Okay. Yeah, so we had in this standardized computer uh, program. We have observed elements, species, and all the, all the qualifiers that were in the system were there in, in the computer. And with that, we could do the observations. Now we have to go. Just a sec. Yeah, you have to change, change, <laughs> change the point of focus, possibly. If okay. Put that in there and then go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And what we could do in that computer was also draw the lines, I have the lines there and make pictures and put them on there. So you could all save all the information that was available and you still can do it, you can have it. And if, of course, what was telling you, you have to go there, you have to do that and that and this. So the procedure, there was a procedure for vegetation plots no vegetation in an urban area. One vegetation plot per GHC, general habitat category. One plot per grassland category. Mark your position. Vegetation plots can be marked permanently. And these kind of things. That's how you do it. That's what he draw and said that this is how you should do it. And we put it into the manual. And then the manual was be used by everyone and could be used and can still be downloaded by everyone if you just go uh, to the website. It has to be a, applicable from Belgium to Greece. Well, UK had its own. So we said, well, Belgium to Greece, that's what we should. And here we are in, uh, in, in uh, I think we are here in, in Greece, yes. And we're also guests coming, this family is coming and what we concluded, a lot of change, things changed in the landscape, such as the roads. You cannot go anymore from Lancaster over sands to Grange, or from Grange to Lancaster, or over, some, or over the sands. That's, that's over. But the, 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 the characteristics of the landscape are still there in different combinations. That's what Bob was very keen to characterize and to see. Also these ash trees, if you, this was in 19, uh, uh, 2007, I think. No, 2000, no, around 2000. If you go there now, there are no ash tree anymore. It's empty, all, all gone. And the land that is, can be accessed easily is being used as grasslands. What not can be accessed is now a forest. So that's the change that took place. And it's important to, to, uh, to identify that and to see what that means and to conclude what it means. What does it mean for vegetation, for flora, and what does it mean for the, for the, for the birds? We have to see. And that's what he wrote down. 
in this little book booklet is uh, the booklet uh, of uh, Bob with all his pictures, all his drawings. You can get it. From, I, I have a digital. So if you want to, you just send me an email. I send it to you. The, but this is Onomas Polacamino, the European landscapes drawn by Bob, explained by friends and colleagues. It's a nice booklet. It's available digital, and you can get it. And this is Onomas Polacamino. Thank you, Rob. Okay. I think that was brilliant capturing of Bob's ethos. It's, it's the sort of thing that everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows. And I hope the people actually listening also appreciate. Are there any comments or any questions to Rob on his presentation? <clears throat> I'm comfortable that we actually move on because I think it wasn't actually really a, it, it was, setting the scene so I, I think that's well set now so Maybe just one yes do you think you could remove that from the i can't remove yeah. it totally kind of... but i can drag it yeah. across yeah, for, 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 oops. <laughs> christine is making herself known you see you can't move it to your screen the other screen or is it not no it, it's it, the reason we're doing it is because we have linked presentations yeah. here so i can, might be able to do yeah, it that's that okay. Yeah. That's okay. right Okay, if we drop that then. So we move on. Let's say we move on. Let me. There we go. A large part of Bob's work, early working life was based on the monitoring of the UK environment. I say UK, it was actually the GB. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I, I always get pedantic about these things. UK includes Ireland, GB is Great Britain. England, Scotland, and Wales. Now, that was this was the work that I started with Bob. Well, I, Bob had already started a long time before me, but in the 1970s, Bob started this, and it's still going, which I think is a great testimony to him. And the importance of this is great, which I'm now going to ask if Lisa can come up and actually give us just a brief description of the how the, the, the countryside survey is a treasure trove. <laughs> so I'm assured that Bob was right-handed and that's flipped around that image, but uh, yeah, an image of yeah. Bob doing some right data hand. collection there. So really nice to be here. Yeah, I'm Lisa Norton. I've been in land use for 23 years now. So yeah, Bob's legacy is very much with me. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a few things. This is a treasure trove, so anyone could pick any number of things out. I'm picking out things that sort of relevant to, to what I'm doing partly. So one thing we get from, from CS is loads of policy questions. Always got people from Natural England or DEFRA online saying, uh, can you tell me what's our most common plant species? How's plant diversity changing? Do we have any information on banks? They suddenly become important and we don't seem to have anything on them. Um, what, where are they? How extensive are they? What sort of habitats are they in? And they expect you to go to the data for it. And you can because it's there. It's something we've collected. Uh, hedges are a really key one at the minute. People want to know how high they are, how wide they are, how, so they can work out how much carbon they've got in them. CS is the place to go because that's the place that's been recording hedges since 78. Um, another area has been uh, measures of natural capital, particularly recently, where's the UK's... Right, I'm going to say UK because one of the reasons I've been manically putting this presentation together is because we've just started the Northern Ireland Countryside Survey, which I'm leading for uh, in Northern Ireland, and that's Bob's fault that I'm so busy. Uh, I'm really pleased that we're doing it, and so are, so are Northern Ireland and the policy staff over there are delighted. But uh, yeah, that's just started now. So think countries are thinking about their natural capital. They're thinking about how much they've got. They're also starting to think about the condition of it. So Natural England are wanting conditioner indi indicators for their 25-year environment plan, and uh, CS is the place they're going to get them from, even though you know, some of it is out of date, they're going to have to go back to CS. Um, so these are the kind of things that we answered from Countryside Survey 2007, changes in plant diversity, and I'm glad to say that soon we'll be able to extend that black line, at least, won't we, Simon, for the larger plots to say what they're looking like now. 
lengths of hedges soon we'll also be able to extend that timeline because uh, natural england has suddenly realized they don't know what's happening to hedges they therefore started to, they funded us so this year we've got mappers going out one of them in the room to measure some hedges in the countryside next year we're going to complete all the english squares so um they've decided they do actually need that data which is great great for us but makes us slightly busy uh, so these are other things we've been able to do with the data, because as we've said, it's just a treasure trove. We've got all sorts of things and you can do things in different ways. So one thing I've done is to provide cultural service messages, measures from Countryside Survey, working with Natural England staff who collect some of the more exper experiential data, the sort of social side, uh, and looking at what people like in the landscape and putting it together with CS data to come up with a, an index. And you'll see we're in a red part, which is good. Okay, so, so we produce these natural capital maps for policy. So Natural England were particularly keen to know where is our carbon, where are our species, etc. And we work with them on a on a project. So showing them where from countryside survey we sampled soil carbon in our uh, soil samples. And on the left is a map of where the carbon is. Uh, on the right is a map of the uh, uncertainties in the data. So the data is good enough that you can provide those kind of things. Um, so we can even do it for water quality from CS 2007 because we collected uh, freshwater investment data in line with the data on what's actually the land cover in those areas. Uh, and so that's, you know, there aren't very many surveys that can cover landscape and freshwater quality. And although we were constrained in our catchment to the one kilometre square, you could still find clear evidence that intensive land use uh, was negatively affecting the water quality and that having woody features alongside rivers was positively affecting it. Um, so this is a, a nature sustainability paper that um, a postdoc produced with some of our data. And, that, and she produced an a, analytical framework for understanding how landscape context affects pond water quality. Uh, again, another area of CS that's pretty unique in having that whole landscape context. Um, so in terms of that's that's contextualizing within within the actual CS squares because you've got the freshwater, you've got the ponds, you've got the rivers, you've got the land cover, you've got the landscape features. But also, I've used CS a lot for contextualizing other data that I've collected. So if you use the same methods, you're able to say something about the data that you're collecting, and that, and I've found that really useful. So I've scaled that water quality modeling down to loads of water where I've done a lot of work uh, and you can you can look at the landscape context you can see there's quite a lot of I knew they were going to do that improved grassland in this square uh, and there's uh, there's not a lot of arable but there is a little bit of urban and those kind of things affect water quality buildings with septic tanks particularly but um and, and so you can use it to kind of understand context even at, at, and to extrapolate from small scales to larger scales uh, and this is another bit of work that i've just uh, been just completing and i've been looking at pasture fed livestock farms and their grassland they want to know if it's better than than the wider countryside and this slide shows um, but it's actually so there is a little PFLA farms table at the bottom, which is of interest. And I can talk to you about that later. But the top part is just uh, a, a look for this project. We looked what does the vegetation look like? What does the soil look like? And what are the relationships between them? And of course, you can do that for countryside survey because they're co-located. And they show that when you've got a lot of ryegrass cover, if it's really improved, you tend to have really high soil P. And that means that you have negative relationships with soil carbon, soil moisture and total taxa if you've got a lot of ryegrass. At the other end of the table where the species richness is high, your soil P is, tends to be high as well, which obviously you don't really want. But your soil carbon, your soil moisture and the number of beasties you're finding in the soil are higher if you've got um, high so those soil properties and your species richness is higher. So I think CS is really a really unique data set in enabling you to look at that. And you can then look at it in, in context with other um, things that you're other, other types of land that you're looking at. So another real 
treasure trove thing out to come out of the treasure trove of the methods. We've already talked about that. And so others of you are going to talk about how it's been used in other countries. This is a, a little snapshot from a talk by Armin Benzler uh, in Germany, who talked um, from the Federal Agency for Nature Conservation, who talked to us quite recently about their randomly stratified sampling. Uh, the Environmental Information Data Centre at CEH, I would argue that it's entirely there because of Countryside Survey. The founding staff all came from Countryside Survey, John Watkins, Rod Scott, Rick Stewart, or the legacy of having to manage long term data effectively means you need something like this. Um, and then there's Claire, our, our personal sort of uh, data management and curation star, and she's been looking after the legacy data sets, uh, which is so important for Countryside Survey and making sure that they're preserved and uh, that we can continue to use them. And my final slide is that is the field ecologists. Uh, this is just some of us lot um, mucking about in Countryside Survey 2007, trying to work out how to use digital equipment for the first time, um, which was quite entertaining. But just the, the comradeship, the, uh, the, the skills and expertise uh, for, for, for hundreds of surveyors, but also for hundreds of us within research, well, all of you here and, uh, and, and many, many others. So, um, I mean, I, I would probably argue that that's the biggest legacy, but uh, yeah, that's, that's me finished. <laughs> Am I in time, Dave? <laughs> you, you missed the bing, so. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Should I just sit down or are people going well, to ask it, questions? <laughs> pe if people have questions, rather than running around with a mic, what we can do is we'll repeat the question before we answer. Are there any questions or any comments? I feel I've got several. I'm very happy to talk to people. Later. Yeah, I think that's the thing that we're also, we've got lunch <laughs> in the atrium, so there will be time. There'll be in the meal this evening, chance, chance to talk. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Right, just a second, I'll just turn that off. Right, so moving on, we're back to Simon. <laughs> <laughs> this time talking more as in his corporal mode, for those of you who've read, oops, sorry, stop talking, Lisa. <laughs> Very ethereal <laughs> <laughs> right. If I reset this, then you'll be on for your yeah. 10 minutes. Oh, that's, even, that's the time is starting. Yeah, that's... I've not started it yet because you haven't started talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you when. Um, yes, Simon is here and he's going to be telling us about, again, one of the very early things that I discovered with Bob was the importance of linear features in landscapes. And this was something, again, that Lisa's been saying how countryside survey tended to bring these things up. I'm sorry, Simon, I'm spoiling your talk here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Simon is going to tell us about linear features. Yeah, so, so the, the, the start here is just a small anecdote because, um, as Rob mentioned, the Cañada project in Spain. So I was fortunate enough to accompany Bob um, to uh, Spain to try and trace the roots of some of these amazing drove roads. And the, the interesting, the, immune, the things got off to a very amusing start because Bob declared at the airport that he'd forgotten his driving license. <laughs> and I didn't have my driving license. And the only chap that did was Robin, who had polio at an early age and was a bit disabled. And the only car he could drive was an automatic or one with a specialized prosthesis. <laughs> And our Spanish wasn't quite good enough <laughs> to say, can we have a specialised prosthesis at the uh, Hertz garage? So we ended up with this amazing, huge Mercedes <laughs> that Robin drove. And so that meant that whenever we turned up in a Spanish village, they thought that either a, the local crime boss had turned up or, or the local mayor. And we're a bit disappointed but also visibly relaxed when three dishevelled Englishmen got out. Um, so that was great. So that was an early, that was sort of Spanish linear features, and that was a fantastic thing to be involved with. So moving back to Britain. So this is a countryside survey square, and this is um, a picture of the range of different plot types we have in our squares, and there's 591 of these um, across Britain, which is Bob's legacy, and it's amazing. And that's where we get the data from to say amazing things about how the landscape has changed species, ecosystems, soils, habitats. So I'm going to concentrate on the linear plots here. And this is one of the things that I thought was just amazing about this data set when I came to work for Bob, that we had this sample of linear features. And I'd come to work from the 
conservation agencies where it's very much phytosociology and looking for releves of homogenous vegetation. And the linear features really didn't feature, if you'll excuse the mixed <laughs> metaphor, they were quite heterogeneous, messy, but I knew from my survey work that there was a lot of diversity in there. And I also knew that often, if you surveyed a piece of landscape, the effects of intensive agriculture meant that within the fields, there was much less than actually in the linear features, but the linear features were often missed. So this seemed remarkable to me that we had data set from areas of, of landscape, so the random area X plots, and you could compare those with what was going on in the linear features. And that just seemed such an amazing thing to be able to do. And it was part of the subject of my PhD. Um, so this is the kind of CS view of the landscape. And this is what really appealed to me about Bob's kind of vision, if you like, for measuring the landscape. So you've got triple SIs, you've got nature reserves embedded in a working landscape in the rural factory floor, if you like, of Britain. Uh, and that comprises conifer plantations, arable land, intensive grasslands, et cetera, but also these linear features, these things that snake their way through the landscape. So interesting questions arise about how maybe these linear features could provide uh, refuges for biodiversity that could be used to kind of seed agri-environment scheme prescriptions, but also the fact that they're under threat, that they're exposed to intensive agriculture, that they're generally narrow, they're quite heterogeneous, so per unit, per unit length of linear feature, the areas are quite small. So in terms of species area effects, you might not expect many rare species or a very large species pool, but they're quite heterogeneous. And we know that heterogeneity drives up diversity. So we might expect them to be rich on the basis of their kind of variation. So these are all interesting questions that we can explore with this amazing data set. So I'm gonna just talk, um, so this is a paper I did for my PhD and uh, Rob, Bob was one of the supervisors, and in fact, Rob was my external supervisor. So thanks, Rob. It could have gone very differently. <laughs> <laughs> might not be here today if you've not been in a nice mood. Um, so uh, this was a, a really nice bit of work. I, I thought it was great, where we we took some um, data from the areas of habitat. So these are the kind of solid lines, and we looked at on the y-axis the count of grass and in indicator species per quadrat. So the solid lines are indicator species per quadrat in these large areas of habitat, these fields, so often uh, um, in the intensive land, but actually sometimes in not so intensive land, and that's described by the x-axis. So we've got percent intensive land use per 1k square on the x-axis. So you, not surprisingly, down at the left-hand end, where you've got very, very little intensive <coughs> land use, the species richness is quite high in both the areas of land, but also in, in these refuge features, these linear features, the field boundaries, road verges, and watercourse banks. And the interesting point about this is that you can ask at what point, as you move along that intensity gradient, does do relatively speaking, the linear features become richer relative to the adjacent areas, and so start to provide a refuge. And you can see that both the areas of habitat and the refuges, the, the, the big thicker black line with its confidence interval, they all decline, as you might expect, as intensive land use increases. But at some point, and it differs by feature, the, the refuge or the linear feature becomes richer relative to the, to the uh, adjacent areas. And in fact, watercourse banks, which turn out to be the very best refuge of all, actually start a richer at every point on that intensive land use gradient. There's just an interesting well, picture up there, just taken outside the outside of Kendall, near where I live, which shows a number of mesotro mesotrophic grass and indicators, Sanguis albora officinalis, Lotharis pretensis, uh, coexisting um, with uh, with sort of coarse grasses and, and more eutrophic species. So this is a, a really interesting thing that we could only do because of the countryside survey data. Um, if I move on to look at some of the other threats. Um, other than intensive land use, you've got invasive species. So this is a gunnera growing on a stream side, just pouring into the into the sea on Jura, uh, near where I, re I, um, I record uh, species. Uh, but often it's not the non-native plants that are the threat, it's the so-called native thugs. It's the native species that are very common and do very well under intensive land use. So things like um, rather species poor hedgerows and, and this very green, fertile, species poor looking grassland. The key thing about this is that the grassland goes right up to the base of the hedge. You've got a fence there. You've got no management going on behind the hedge. So you've got a successional process going on, shading, exposure to enriched runoff and nutrients. So that kind of zone, if you like, underneath the hedge 
is very, very pressured and is caught in a kind of a pincer movement and is hard up against the intensive management going on in the field. It all looks very green and that's a good indicator, isn't it, of how fertile this system is. And this is a countryside survey plot. Um, so uh, other situations, so you've got a, a nice situation here on the left hand side, we've got a lovely ancient path in East Lancashire embedded in an incredibly intensive landscape. And in this one kilometre square, this is again a countryside survey square, the residual biodiversity is only really in places like this, you know, where, but the, the other thing that's going on here, of course, is that it, this isn't managed. It's not part of the rural factory floor. It's not part of the farm enterprise. It's not even funded by any agri-environment prescriptions. So it's subject to succession, it's overgrown, it's shaded, mm -hmm. and that acts as also a filter. So the so sort of species that might persist have to be shade tolerant. And that, of course, removes some of those grass and species that we, we might want. Um, but it's very good for ancient woodland indicators. This has probably been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's round full of nice ferns, things like uh, iris fetidissima, um, you know, really nice sort of woodland plants, but it's quite narrow again. And then when the linear features are exposed directly to agriculture, as on the right hand side, you can see this, um, this kind of browny stuff. Well, this is all a cattle excrement. So the, the cattle sit there and kind of, you know, just do their thing in the side of the field. And so you can imagine that any kind of refuge function of this field boundary is pretty much compromised by the, the, the intensive land use that's going on here. Um, and again, that's another countryside survey, survey plot. Um, you know, also the effects of intensive agriculture. So this is looking at those linear features. Again, this is a field boundary at the very high levels of intensive land use within the square. And in fact, we have, um, uh, an injurious weeds act in Britain. And I think there's five injurious weeds on that act. And every one of those five is in this picture here, uh, <laughs> compromising the kind of refuge function of this, uh, this field boundary, which is actually right next to one of the Bunts GB Broadleaf Woodland Survey sites, which Claire's gonna talk about. So not especially good as a buffer zone, this really. You've got ragwort in here, Cir Senecio jacobea, Circin vulgari, Arvensi, Rumex obtusifolius, Rumex uh, crispus, all sort of growing quite happily in this very, very fertile field edge in Southwest Wales. Very hard grazed, uh, very highly fertilized. Things are a little bit better here. This is an amenity grass and and you know, we know from work that we've also done on countryside survey data that the linear features are great for nectar plants on the basis of their kind of refuge function, the residual diversity. Many of those species are, are nectar providers and often the only sort of source of that in these intensive landscapes. And this is really nice. You've got a slightly larger ecotone here with comfrey, brown knapweed, some willow herb, um, other things in there, some nice shrubs. So a lot, a lot of nectar going on in, in this linear feature. Changes over time. Again, countryside survey is just superb for this. And we were able to show um, how woody cover has changed on these on the stream sides in particular since the first recording in 1978 through to 2007. So a dramatic increase in successful effects and the effect of woody cover and shade on our stream sides acting as another effect alongside eutrophication and exposure to nutrients in suppressing that residual di diversity, driving down that, that line. Um, has some nice pictures there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a nice that's, way of saying. That's ten minutes. So if you just okay, I'm I'm nearly there actually. Yeah, no, I know. There that's... you go. Mm -hmm. Just the light, just bringing us up to date. Yes. Um, unfortunately, at the minute we haven't surveyed all the repeat linear plots from across Britain, but uh, there's a number of other projects that are in train that will help do that. And Lisa mentioned the hedges, but we did do we did do this in Wales a, a while ago. So we do know that. Um, from 2007 up to 2016, these kind of successional processes are, have actually continued, at least in Wales, with um, decreases in, in forb species, which are generally shade intolerant, many of them. So not surprisingly, with the increase in woody species, lack of management, forbs, forb diversity tends to go down. That tends to have impacted those species that provide nectar. Um, lots and lots of um, stability, though, the sort of black, the black bars show that lo lots of things haven't actually changed. But generally speaking, uh, uh, an ongoing successional effect. And then just had to show you this, because 1996, this was the very first job I did for Bob when he said to me, Simon, take your tent and, a, and one of the uh, Ford Escorts and just drive around Cumbria and survey some road villages. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> I'm trying to explain that to my mum as a job was quite yeah. funny, but I thought it was marvellous. And just a couple of weeks ago, I went to the same spot and Blismus Compressors is still there. So sometimes there is a little bit of good news. Uh, to be yeah, that's it, Dave. On that good news, 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. Have there any questions for Simon or comments? There will be chance at over lunch, I'm certain, um, but there's plenty that people will want to talk to Simon about. Okay, we move on a bit and actually look at if like ideas of classification and what we call things, the ideas of habitats. Pete, are you happy? Pete, Pete Carey, happy yeah, to come up yeah, and I'm... do your presentation? Before I start, as soon as I sat down, I noticed this post, which is the C, the sort of um, Lancaster Environment Centre. Have you seen their, their um, motto, the art of collaboration? If that doesn't sum up Bob, I don't know what does. <laughs> which I think yeah. is quite hilarious. <laughs> um, right, as I start, I'd just like to say, whenever Bob contacted me, because we live a long way apart, it was like, where's he going to ask me to go next? <laughs> and most of you I've met, but I've actually not worked with that many people because Bob used to just take me along for as a sounding board, I think, or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, and one of the places he took me was the Diva Valley now in, uh, in the Picos de Europa. Um, we heard about it earlier with Charlotte Mason, and I actually went there and I got involved with an Earthwatch project from a man called John Dover. Um, looking at the orchids in this area, and it's a biogeographer's ge nightmare. <laughs> You've got alpine, Mediterranean, and uh, boreal habitats all in this photo. That's why I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> it is absolutely stunning, and I kept going back with and without Bob over the years. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is something you most of you know about, and that's habitats and adding these qualifiers and why that legacy is so important. I don't know whether it was Bob's idea in the first place, but he certainly made sure the rest of us got the idea. So in true Bob style, how many of you would guess which habitat map is which? Uh, from uh, Put your hands up if you know which one of those is which. All right, just. Um, Habitat maps themselves, these are land cover map 2000. And the one on my right, your left, is East Anglia. And the, most of you will guess that yellow is arable and green is grassland. On the right is Cornwall. They're on the same scale, field size, yeah. incredibly different. So the question is, yeah, that will make sense. We know what the habitats are from space, kind of. Um, but how did they come about? We can't answer that just from habitat map. And what Bob and others have done is come up with these ideas of qualifiers. And it gives a load of context about the habitats that we've got, that we've mapped. So starting with countryside survey, there were primary qualifiers. So we could say it for a, this is actually a really nice piece of uh, chalk grassland on the um, South Downs at Juniper Hall, where I teach students still. But we've got qualifiers like things like lay, whether it's a amenity grass, whether it's mown, whether there are ant hills, there are ant hills all over this. Mm -hmm. um, whether there's ridge and furrow present, not here as it turns out. Um, what the vegetation type is, what the species are, and what the species cover on is, and because we go back to the same places each time. We know how these change and we can explain change in habitats based on qualifier information that we've been gathering. If you just wrote target notes or notes about that, anyone who's looked at those from different surveyors in the past, you trying to gather the information from those is almost impossible because it's so varied. And in a lot of cases in people's filing cabinets and lost forever. And we also had um, data on the management, so agricultural use, whether it's beef, cattle, dairy, goats, hay, horses, pigs, sheep, silage, all of those types of things uh, would come out. Um, and you can see how that's changed over time. Um, so deer grazing pressure in Scotland, this is Glenetiv, and uh, it's not hard to see deer in Scotland these days. And there are so many other things. 
and they're increasing, and we know that from all sorts of data, but qualifiers in especially. especially. Now, Bob, as Rob uh, alluded yeah. earlier, um, took this into Biohab as well. And there are a lot of qualifiers in Biohab. And um, Bob would take me off to places. In this case, I think I was with Sander and Marta in particular or on this trip. And he was desperate to find the most extreme habitats to make sure they all worked in Biohab. And this was looking for the Zurich ones. Uh, it was interesting. So I met uh, the bush Zisophus for the first time yeah. on that, that project. Uh, so we had moisture regime, Ellenberg values, then we have global codes, height and depth, substrate, area linear codes. All of this information is in Biohab and uh, they are in different levels of Biohab. So the qualifiers are on different sheets or on different drop down menus. Oh, sorry. And then um, we have non biotic ones. So things like this amazing soft cliff in South Devon. Um, <laughs> Absolute nightmare to map because it's almost vertical. Um, but we've got all the geomorphology, geology, soils, and then archaeology, uh, life form complexes are there, sea marine, coastal. Um, the number of different qualifiers you could apply to that cliff face is, is extraordinary. And it's soft ish, <laughs> it's collapsible. And then I ended up on one trip in Estonia. And so we had um, yeah, different types of manage management. So how the woodlands are management and forests are management, managed, um, whether there's agricultural or herbaceous. So it's similar to some of the other qualifiers, but slightly different. Uh, so there's context there. I mean, that type of birch woodland could be almost anywhere, I think, in Northern Europe. And then there was enterprise. So whether things are urban, recreation, um, and those sorts of things. And this is one of the most famous occasions I, I remember in my head. Um, Bob and Frida had a favorite bar in uh, near a place called Pechon on the northern coast of Spain. And because I was driving, I had to stop. And we had went to the bar. I looked out the window in this caravan park. And that just before the caravans turned up at the start of the season, that is totally covered with an orchid called Serapius cordigera. And it's just extraordinary. You would never guess that, that you would find uh, an orchid population underneath where caravans normally park. So my um, mantra then became, whenever Bob and Frieda say stop at a bar, it's all, you never know what you might find. <laughs> so always stop. So there's Frieda taking photo of the same. And it was the first time I'd ever seen that species as well which considering how many orchids I've seen is quite remarkable. And there are more. <laughs> so at the end of Biohab, you have the ability to put it into pan-European classifications, the local classifications, and any phycological associations. And that's really important for making it more applicable and getting data in from other people. And I will explain now what's happened since Biohab. The problem with Biohab was Bob would try and make us do things. He would have rules, and that was part of his ethos. Now, ecological consultants do not like obeying rules. I can tell you that now. And um, so in the UK, we had a thing called Phase One Habitat Survey, and that was created in the 1970s, pre-GIS, pre-Biodiversity Action Plan, pre-Annex One Habitats. And sadly, it doesn't include any of those. <laughs> so it became um, not really fit for purpose and we needed one. So we persuaded myself, Lisa, Norton, Joe, Tariq, Bill, uh, Butcher and Bob um, Edmonds, persuaded the industry that it needed a new classification before we really started developing it. And with their help and their uh, blessing. We've created a thing called the UK Habitat Classification, and it includes um, um, annex habitats and priority habitats, and it's hierarchical. 
It has major biomes at the top, then the MISE categories, mapping and assessment of ecosystem services, which is a pan-European system, uh, which is very broad. Then the UK broad habitats, priority habitats, and Annex 1 habitats. So it's applicable. And it's in 2019, the government and uh, Natural England adopted it as the base classification for all biodiversity net gain metric calculations, which made our life very busy overnight <laughs> because everybody needed to learn how to use it. The important thing is we've got qualifiers in there and that is probably me and Lisa's fault <laughs> because we um, basically told Bill Butcher that we needed these things and they were in Biohab and they provide all the context. And you can see here the groupings that we've got. And I, you see environmental qualifier, there's one there seasonally wet, they're exactly the same as the Biohab ones, identical using the same um, definitions. So, you know, there's the overlap with Biohab is, uh, or the influence of Biohab is in there with all of these qualifiers and they provide all the extra information. And like Simon was saying, we've got this treasure trove and it's really an untapped resource at the moment, I would say. Um, Ruth is here, Ruth Swetnam, who did a, uh, a PhD looking at um, the old habitat data and some of the contextual information for her PhD, but there's not been a huge amount to interrogate the qualifiers in countryside survey. And importantly, when we um, get to uh, biohab data coming in in a large way, or the UK have data, there's gonna be all of these fields uh, of data that we can use. Um, so fields two to five are those qualifiers that uh, the first set of biohab qualifiers I mentioned, but the importance of UK ha have it's, it's designed so, and Simon, you did some work looking at it, I think, that it does fit in to um, BioHab and um, certainly the letter fields, the ones that I said will bring in local classifications and <coughs> Annex 1 habitats, and all the secondary codes have equivalent BioHab qualifiers, so we can bring any UK data collected now into um, BioHab should uh, any pan-European project get going again. And Bob's legacy to us is that he's given us the ability to quantitatively and objectively assess temporal aspects in European landscapes and their management. Um, how they've changed, do they change at the moment, and are they going to change in the future with climate change and various other things? So um, a question that I've tried to answer a few times is how stable are they? Um, and in the case of around Bob's home, incredibly stable. I think we had 250 polygons around his house that we looked at, and only four had changed from 1978 to 2010. <laughs> and one of those had gone from being a farmer's field to a caravan pot. Yeah. So there's almost no change in that landscape, but in East Anglia, where I lived, it changes regularly and uh, in a large amount. So but it's because of those qualifiers we can say why. Okay, I'll finish. Okay. Anybody with any comments or questions? Yes. No, I'm just wondering what Bob's view was that the UK have that classification thing. So I'm not thinking it's great, but what does Bob think of it? Could, um, you, could you come back and... Yeah. Right. Jonathan Porter's just asked about Bob's view know. of the habitat, that's just for the people who might not get that on the <laughs> habitat classification. And he's put Pete on the spot. So I'll leave not Pete, really, Pete because, to answer. Um, <laughs> partly because of COVID, um, we didn't really talk very much or anything. So I never found out what we thought about it. We never said, Lisa might know more. No, 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 no. So um, uh, because it's objective, I think you know. Objective and because it fits into Biohab. I think the problem with Biohab is a lot of people just couldn't get the idea of leafy hemi cryptophytes. <laughs> I have enough trouble getting them to tell the difference between an oak and an ash tree. So. <laughs> so, 
I think I agree with you. I think Bob did like structure. He liked yeah. regular things which were repeatable. To me, that's one of the important things about the countryside survey is it's not the state, it's the change. And the identification of change is very difficult unless you record things in a way that you can say, yes, what I recorded there, I can actually compare to that. And I remember trying to say what, what had changed and whether a, a parcel would go from one main category to another when you say, oh, you might have seen somebody's recorded, it's gone from 25 to 50% cover of a certain vegetation type. How good is that recording? How important is that as a change? And, so, and it's, I did the work, John Watkins, who showed his face at the door earlier, we did quite a lot trying to look at that analysis. Just yeah. say something. Um, an issue we now have is because of biodiversity net gain and developers having to show it, there's big money involved in knowing exactly what biodiversity you've got or which habitats you've got. So as a profession, an ecological consultants are now under extreme scrutiny because big money is involved. So making it consistent and um, explainable what, why you say the habitat is what it is, is become hugely important. Uh, and we have to, speaking on behalf of the ecological consultants, the ecological consultants have now got to defend themselves in um, what they said. So that objectivity is now become uh, suddenly very important indeed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what we did uh, when we made the European classification is try to define borders that were that were applicable through all Europe. Or if not, then we just had a local uh, variation. Yeah. yeah. No, I and I think it's. The great thing about all these systems, in some ways, it, it carries an ethos of Bob in that it comes back to, we didn't start by recording broad habitats, but that was something we recorded. It's a case of you record things in more detail so that you can then put them together in a different way. Yeah. All these systems have a consistency and it's because it's often the same people going through and drawing things from one project to another. But I think that is, fundamentally important. Right. Let's see you. Well, we now go back in time. <laughs> <laughs> we will, Claire, Claire Wood is going to tell us about the Woodlands survey. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave. Yeah, so I'm just going to describe a bit about the background and the latest news from what we're now calling the Bunce Woodland Survey of <laughs> Great Britain. Um, so we, we're running a um, current edition of the um, survey and it's been run by Simon Smart and myself um, as data manager. And Bob, of course, helped us get it off the ground um, again this time. Um, so our current challenge is to repeat the surveys from uh, 1971 and um, the Broadleaf Woodland Survey and the Scottish Pinewood Survey. Um, so Bob and team first set this survey up in 1971 back at Millwood. And it was actually two separate surveys at that point. It was 103 Broadleaf Woodlands. Uh, across Britain, and it was 27 native pine woods uh, across Scotland. And um, Simon ran a repeat of the broadleaf survey back in the early 2000s. Um, and so this time the Woodland Trust are supporting us with this and um, various other uh, collaborators as well. Um, so the current aims of uh, this project is to provide an evidence base for understanding the effects of multiple drivers across a nationally representative sample of woodlands of higher conservation value <coughs> um, over 50 years. So thanks yeah. to Bob's foresight in setting up this survey, we've now got this amazing 50-year time span resource, which is going to let us look at change 
um, across all these different issues, uh, things like land use, disturbance, um, tree disease, it's a big issue at the moment, um, acidification, nitrogen deposition, uh, things like deer grazing and um, disturbance at the local level of the woodlands, and also issues linking to ecosystem services. Uh, so just an overview of the, the sites we're visiting. Um, the broadleaf sites were 103 sites and the mainly ancient semi-natural woodlands um, of conservation interest. So Bob originally chose these sites in a statistical way. Um, there was a, um, a, a much less detailed uh, woodland survey in the 60s um, for the nature conservation review. And, and from that, Bob managed to um, select these representative sites from that pool of information. So as I've said, the broadleaf sites were first surveyed in 73, uh, 71, and um, for the second time in the early 2000s. So this is the third repeat now of those sites. Uh, with the Pinewood sites, this is only the second time we've visited those in most cases. Um, so it's 27 native Pinewoods across Scotland. And these are the major 27 Pinewoods identified in the classic text by Stephen and Carlisle, <coughs> Pinewoods of Scotland. Um, in terms of sampling points, um, each woodland has 16 um, plots across um, each woodland. Um, so Bob decided 16 was a, a nice number to survey <laughs> based on um, pilot surveys he did in the late 60s in the Lake District. So he chose the plots in a dispersed random manner um, to ensure coverage of the whole site. <laughs> And I think probably most people will be familiar with this plot design and um, still sometimes call it a Wally plot after Bob's colleague, Wally Shaw. Um, so at each of these 16 points, we survey uh, one of these plots. Um, and it's, so it's a nested design um, and surveyors work outwards recording um, species from subsequent nests and um, record trees in different quarters of the plot. Uh, so as well as the ground floor and trees, we're collecting um, some general site information. Um, also, we're taking a soil sample, which we'll analyze for pH and loss on ignition. And new in this survey is um, a library of photographs. Um, which is, is going to be a really good resource this time. Um, in this survey, we've moved to collecting data electronically. So we've gone from handwritten forms to, to these um, electronic forms. Um, that's a, a bit of a relief um, when you think about Bob's famously neat handwriting there. <laughs> Um, in terms of progress, we're nearly there now. We've just got a handful of sites left um, to finish in the next couple of weeks. So this dashboard's actually slightly out of date now. Um, yeah, we overcame a slightly truncated season in, in 2020 for obvious reasons, but we've managed to, to make up the ground, which is great. Um, so we, we're going to be um, doing a lot of analysis over the winter. Um, so we're going to be looking at issues like has soil pH continued to rise slightly or has it leveled off? Um, so soil organic matter uh, content appear to be stable. A um, couple of very early analysis there suggest that the pH may be, be doing that. Um, we, we still don't know it's going to be interesting to see. Um, we're going to be looking at species richness decline. Uh, 
also from the data we're going to have, uh, we can look at distribution of tree sizes and species, percentages of dead trees across sites. Uh, all that can, can help us um, think about um, site management. Um, so just in conclusion, um, surveying's almost complete for the second time in the pine woods and the third time um, in the broadleaf woods. And we're now going to have this amazing data set across 50 years. Um, it's, it's actually a, a really key UKCH long-term data set now. Um, so it's great Bob thought about those repeatable methods back in 71. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to answer lots of questions about woodland management and disturbance, acidification, disease, plant species riches, um, and all other kinds of drivers, drivers of change. <laughs> Any questions for Claire? I've got one that's not for, oh, sorry. Um, when the survey was done in 2000 or around that time, found that a lot of the plots had become almost inaccessible <laughs> as it changed back the other way, or are they even more inaccessible? Well, anecdotally, Wales is <laughs> the most. <laughs> <laughs> the worst place for inaccessibility. Um, otherwise, we've not had many complaints, have we? No, I mean, we have sort of jokes about trying to point your own blood into the brambles <laughs> and, and um, having sort of trained small dogs that can go. It's the brambles that is the thing, that, especially in Wales. That's the, yeah, we just fruit to coat us, it's really taken off. And... But if, if you have brambles, so you have unification. Yeah, and also because of the ash dieback letting light into oh, the okay. canopy that sort of preempts you know, okay. conditions for the brown walls and then it takes off. But yes, we seem to have managed, don't we? The, the consultants seem to have got in there and done their best. So yeah, well, one, of the, one of them did recommend having a, a rubber diving suit. <laughs> <laughs> that was the survey, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Are you actually spotting things such as ash dieback oh, yeah. things like that are showing a through? Lot. Yeah. Because it, it's, if you like, something that the, gen, the wider general public are likely to heard of. And if you can say, oh, yes, that's a clear signal, but you can then see other things coming through as well, it actually makes the data seem extremely valuable. So, yeah. Duncan. Yeah. How did you manage to relocate the original plots? I just think in 1971, the technology was pretty basic. How did you, mm. how did you this time we're trying quite a novel um, way of relocating them using the diameter at breast height data. So the surveyors have a point on the map where they roughly know to go to. And they also have GPS points from the last survey in most cases. Um, but we, we also tried this method to try and get it a bit more accurate so they'll have information and, and the surveyors will be looking around and it'll say two oaks and 50 centimetre DBH. So immediately they'll be looking around trying to see if they can spot the different tree. And I think it's, it's um, definitely helped. I think we're worried about we worried about that approach because we went out with some ecologies from mm. Ghent from the forest lab there. And, and it was a bit of a worry that it might result in bias and if we use the original tree DNA yeah. data, but the kind of emphasis is almost not on being in the right place because we don't know exactly mm. where that is, but not being in the wrong place. So if you've got a really dramatic difference in species composition, it suggests that you're, you know, you need to probably think again a little bit. But and and I was I think we were convinced really by going out with with um, Peter Dupren and the others, and they sort of convinced us that this would probably work. But on top of that, we we sort of think that we can model the relocation error as well. We can do a little bit, bit more sophisticated approach this time in the analysis by using the QA data to estimate the relocation error and just build that into the, into the analysis of the so a couple of approaches. Nigel? I haven't seen any latitudinal shifts in species. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a bit in a few years. Or is it too late to say that? 
Yeah, for, for this current survey, it's it's too early to say. Um, I don't know about the last last one. Yeah, because because of the resolution of the survey, it's it's not it's not so good at kind of grid square species distribution of changes. It's um, but what it is quite good at is looking at say um, trends in cover or um, trends in species groups that can be assigned to different by ge geographical elements. Mm -hmm. So. There was some suspicion that maybe Holly had uh, benefited from um, some of the sort of climate trends, but I think because it was just two surveys, we were yeah we were pretty reluctant to draw any firm conclusions at that point. So I think next time now we've got three points in time, we'll definitely revisit that issue. One last question, which is a point of information which I know I'm reasonably sure you won't be able to answer, but I think Richard is probably the only person, Richard Scott is the only person in the room who may be able to answer this. Is that Dave Horrell? Could be, yeah. yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> <Claire knows. laughs> it is. It is, right, no. <laughs> Sorry, it's, again, just another flash from the past. He was a, was a radio ecologist who worked a lot with my wife. So anyway, thank you for that, Claire. Another excellent presentation. So next we have Stephen Hall. Now, Stephen actually did have two presentations, but we're only doing one, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, that's fine. So uh, for those of you, because I, I think you actually it went into Bob's 70th book with the numbers. Yes. So yes, th th right. yeah, there is a presentation about how far Bob is from Charles Darwin. Oh yeah. But but <laughs> so which is Stephen's work. So but anyway, Stephen, you're going to talk us now about a smaller scale, but I think some very similar attributes of Bob's work. Right. Talking about Chillingham and, and the which button do I press to move on? If you just use the arrow keys there. All right. Okay. So yep. that will take you forward. Yep. That will take you back, and. You can stay in mm -hmm. there. The only way out is to press the escape key. Good. Okay. Or screen fail. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I think one usually has on this particular first slide your institutional affiliations, and um, in my case, is while slightly complex, um, but the simple fact is that the um, most of the results I'm going to present were written up while Bob and I were both members of Carlef Saps Group in Estonia. And so we're very grateful for the support that was provided through that means. Um, right, Chillingham, halfway between Newcastle and Edinburgh. It's got a castle attached to it, which you can see um, kind of bottom, uh, bottom left-hand quarter there. The park and the enclosed area that the association owns and which the cattle range is there in, in the... Um, yellow marker. Unusually for a landscape park, it's not actually linked with the, with the castle. So um, there's an interesting landscape history to this, um, which um, I'm not going to go into in very great detail at all this time around. But um, you can see it's quite clearly got quite an altitudinal range there. It goes from essentially um, a basin, a river basin at the bottom up onto the heathery hills at the top. Um, now the cattle are the unique feature of the park and these cattle have lived in a, this baronial park certainly since the 1600s and possibly earlier than that. There's some various zoological features of interest, the massive history of inbreeding um, no known admixture from other breeds, boatloads of genetic stuff now about this inbreeding. Uh, management terms, it's a natural sex ratio and age distribution. Uh, there's no castration and culling is only for welfare reasons. Not in, uh, there's no systematic culling to keep the numbers to any particular level. Um, because of this natural sex ratio and age distribution, they are, they are termed wild cattle. Well, they're only wild in that sense. They are descendants of husbanded cattle. Almost certainly the herd was put together from attractive animals in the 1600s. 
and um, other stories of them having miraculously survived for thousands of years in the Caledonian forest. Um, it used to be the company line, but it isn't now. Um, Bob um, got very attached to Chillingham and um, he did these nice little drawings, which, um, um, which I treasure. And um, he, he came on several occasions and um, Frieda and David as well. And they were um, made many friends there, in fact. Um, as I say, it's um, a parkland landscape. As such, it's designed. It's a designed landscape um, dating from 1799 to 1808. That was when the current design was established. And it was superimposed on a medieval deer park, which would itself have been superimposed on a, on a wood pasture of some kind. Um, it's got species rich grasslands and it's got a wide diversity of trees. And the um, diversity of trees is perhaps effectively illustrated by that autumn photograph there showing the brown leaves are actually on an oak tree, a pollard, which is probably, was probably planted in, in 1600. And um, to the left behind that oak tree, there are alder trees on the stream sides and on the right, now hidden by um, uh, our add-on add here, there's um, a beech stand which was planted in 1789. So there's a considerable range of trees um, and ages and, um, and species as well, and I'll come to that in a little later. In fact, Chillingham had a great wood in it, and the great wood is actually marked there with the sort of compass rows um, in the middle. That um, map is um, the so-called estate terrier, and that was drawn in 1711. It was um, rather a contentious map even at the time because it was actually drawn off survey data um, by um, a, a firm that was active in London. And they used the, 18, the 1711 equivalent of Letraset um, to put in, to dot the place with fallow deer and um, no wild cattle there in that 1711 um, map. But, and in fact, the, um, the landscape features in the map can be interpreted on the ground, but it's not, it's not straightforward. At any rate, the great wood, which had that, the main great wood section was the bit with the compass rose. There was another great wood section just to the left. The whole lot was clear felled in 1754. And the documents relating to this are in various archives, whether at Kew or at, um, near, at the county record office near Morpeth. And they can be, re can be referred to. Um, the, the great wood was clear felled and sold, and it appeared that all the streamside trees were felled as well. And, but these were not uprooted. Um, and as I say, there is one very old oak that seems to have been some sort of boundary marker, and that survived as a pollard. There was a subsequent um, remodeling in 1750s, and that was um, kind of, um, if you like, a temporary thing. Uh, because in 1799, they actually put a great deal of work into uprooting the stumps that were remained from 1754, but they, they left um, se several the streamside stumps and one small patch of the former great wood. And that landscape design was geared towards taking the woodland off the flat ground and putting it on the slopes. So Chillingham Park, as we have it to today, is the result of... Um, quite extensive interventions over the, over the years. So it's, um, as we have it at the moment, and that is a photograph that Ellis took that, and um, so I pinched it for this presentation, but um, a panoramic photograph um, showing um, the, the, what we have, it's a, a kind of wood pasture, but it doesn't, it's not a wood pasture in the sense of a lot of individual trees dotted over the landscape. Um, it's really, uh, clumps and individual trees and linear features within a matrix of grassland, which um, is essentially species rich infertile grassland, which used, as you all know, used to be very common in Britain, less so now. Anyway, Bob became involved in 1978 because a mutual acquaintance put us in touch. And um, he came over and set up um, the survey 
and um, got me started on that. And we surveyed the park with the methodology that subsequently became the countryside vegetation system. So that's when it, the story begins of Bob being involved at Chillingham. Now, the, well, the survey was repeated in, uh, in a slightly um, uh, extended way in 2006 to eight, and again in 2017. And in each survey, the same sampled areas were revisited. And that means that we've got data of the changes in vegetation over a 39 year period. And incidentally, that maps on to data I've got on the cattle on dates of birth and numbers and mortality and all that sort of stuff. This actually goes back to the 1950s. So we've got um, quite a nice long data set here. Now, the key feature from the plant's point of view was that between 1980 and 2005, the park was fertilized with lime. And the next slide will explain why. But um, the species diversity had been 30 species in per 100 square meter plot in 1978. It was down to 23 in 06 uh, to 08, by which time there's 20 years worth of lime on the place. And it's now back up, it's gone up to 2017. And one uses the phrase, it has gone back up, back up, which is a little misleading because it suggests that the species that have been lost have been regained. In fact, as you all know, but there's some, there's some new species in there. Um, well, why was the park fertilized? Now, here you have an area of obvious um, botanical interest, which has been, been willfully taken out of that. And it's not a commercial park. So we haven't got an excuse of needing to make a profit on it. It was done because of the priority that the cattle have in Chillingham Park. And what happened was in early 1980, we lost six lactating cows with, of course, their calves, um, apparently due to magnesium deficiency, staggers. And it was quite clear that the mineral status of the park was too poor to support both the herd and the flock of 300 sheep, which were there under a separate grazing tenancy. And the policy had always been do not do anything in relation to the cattle. It was quite clear this policy was now bankrupt. Uh, so the park was limed on a rotational basis for those 24 years. And over that period, I worked it out that each square meter received on average almost a kilo of lime over 25 years. Now that's not a heavy rate actually for, for that, that sort of um, operation. But the, the, there have been no further deaths of cows as, as a result of magnesium deficiency. If we lose a cow, it's either because she's, <clears throat> she's old or in one, just over 1% 1 of cases, it will be a failure during birth. And that is a great deal lower than, than the normal um, failure, birth failure in, um, in cattle. Well, consequences of the vegetation, um, there are various ways of expressing this, but here we've, I've done it as um, Ellenberg scores. And um, I don't know, that won't be wildly clear for people at the back, but we've got these box plots um, and the, the, um, the central points are indicated. And you can see how pH was quite low um, in, in um, 1978, when it was up in 08 and then was down a little bit in 17. And the other Ellenberg features, if you like, the fertility also showed that increase from 78 to 2006 to eight. Um, the light regime showed that increase and the wetness showed a decrease. Now the changes from eight to 17 are not spectacular. That's the first thing. Um, but um, at least it, it looks as the process might be being reversed. And of course those changes are against the context of eutrophication, which is, as we know, is um, widespread anyway. So it could be these, um, the evident changes as a result from, of the liming and the sheep grazing from 78 to 06 are quite clear. There's, I would say conservatively and frankly, realistically, it's a partial remediation by 2017. <clears throat> and um, on, again, the partner um, data set is, of course, your, your um, competitor stress tolerated to ruderal scales. And sure enough, um, we've got a, the sort of 
parallel thing that you'd expect. We've got an increase in competitors from 78 um, to 06. We've got a decrease in stress tolerators, an increase in ruderals. But in this case, I, no one can really argue that the situation has changed from 08 to 17. Um, maybe, uh, although to go around the place you, you, and just look at what's there, I think I'm seeing things there now that simply didn't, weren't there before. Like Millennia, which is rather surprising. The place was so caned by the grazing that Millennia was excluded in the 78 one. Um, I found Triantalis, your Rapaya, in winter, chickweed wintergreen last time I was up there. And, um, you know, that suddenly come in, in 2021. And um, red clover is now quite widespread and it was really very scarce in 78. So these changes that can happen on in, what very evidently on a species specific way, but they won't necessarily show up in the in the in a rigorous science statistical analysis. Well, um, so what's the conservation significance of this activity? Well, we don't have rare plants in Chile, but it we, is an unusually species rich in first in fertile grassland. National Trust sponsored a survey years ago. Um, and it's been updated, so I don't know how the situation is now, but it's probably slightly changed from this, but it, Chillingham has all, had always been unusual, very unusual as a parkland in having really old trees, but also pasture that is in good condition. And um, that's the way we're going to keep it. Um, although, as always, the conservation priority is the cattle herd. And just... Um, in case you're wondering what had happened to the sheep, the sheep went out in 05 when we went in the stewardship scheme and we bought out the tenancy and the sheep went out. And that's one reason why numbers of the cattle are, are very healthy at the moment. Bob and the trees of Chillingham. Well, it's not just Bob. We've got some the lower, there's a party of landscape ecologists on the left, on the right hand side. Of, Mark and his family. Um, on the far left, that's um, the warden at the time. And um, on the right, of course, is Bob, who, while everyone else is enraptured by the cattle, he's admiring the tree canopy. And um, so uh, that's, um, that's Bob in action here. Anyway, we did a tree survey, and it was a spectacular one of this um, ancient oak. This is the oldest oak in Chillingham Park. And the girth was consistent with this, this planting date. And it, it had a stack of veteran attributes. And um, uh, such as, for example, dead wood in and beneath the tree, the epiphytes of rotten wood, etc. And it did occur to us that, well, we've got a even aged tree population from 1750, some 17. 54 for the streamside alders and things like that. We've got some dated plantations um, from the uh, 1799, um, 1808 remodeling. Uh, what about some species comparisons of veteran attributes? And this actually, this study of course is before Kalara. So um, our data might actually have a, a wider applicability. We also surveyed the trees and classified not only as species and other things, but also what sort of features they were in. Were they on their own? Were they in linear, linear um, pattern or were they in clumps? So our data sets all there for, for this, for this um, kind of information. Well, um, veteran attributes, um, Bob created a bobbish list of things. And broadly speaking, you've got morphology, <laughs> You've got some, what sort of epiphytes there are. You've got lesions of various kinds. That's the word I use, being a zoologist by background. And at the bottom, you've got context. And a few of these, slightly surprising. I mean, um, but, um, and I've got a couple of pictures to show to illustrate some of these things. But all of these are the kind of things which would correlate with an invertebrate and, and, and the epiphytic diversity. So it's worth recording. And here are a couple of examples. Again, um, there's, there's, the magnification doesn't do any favors, particularly to the photo on the left, but what we have there is an alder. It had a rowan tree growing in and producing lots of berries. Um, in, and from rooted into the crook of that alder tree. And this, this is sort of thing that would be familiar to 
triologists generally, but that was a bird tree. And Rowan has taken root in the Crook of the Alder. There's another bird tree on the right, and there the, that's an alder, again with Rowan in full flower. And that's actually, um, both trees seem to be doing all right there. But this is quite clearly a, a veteran feature that's going to be of biodiversity interest and probable significance. Phoenix tree, there we have a silver birch. Um, to get to silver birches that for all we know date from that particular wood planted in 1789. Um, and again, that's unusual. And also unusual is the practice of stone mulching where we've got an oak tree standing on its own on the right and it had, it had rocks planted up around it. Um, and that would be, it would be to protect the sapling as it grew. So um, here we are, that's the number of trees surveyed, the percentage of trees with more than three veteran attributes, the mean number of veteran attributes. And one of the things here was the very high value of alder as having lots of veteran attributes. And it could be that if we're going to lose ashes off the landscape, there's something of a case for um, the targeted planting and propagation of alders, I would say, if we want to do biodiversity measures. This stuff's all been published. Well, okay, implications for the management of Chillingham Park. It supports the practical measures we're taking to conserve land, grasslands and trees. It contributes to understanding the population dynamics of the cattle herd, enhances the educational value of the park. The better the cattle are known, the less likely they are to be all shot in a foot and mouth outbreak. That's, that's the crude evaluation. We would want to make it politically impossible to cull them and that sort of circumstance. For landscape ecology, long-term studies, objective vegetation classification, it also provides an example of reconciling conservation priorities. And I think it, we've probably also made some sort of contribution <laughs> to the characterization of veteran trees. So thank you, Bob, for making the whole thing possible. <laughs> Are there any questions? The veteran tree uh, work. The reason we stopped in Peshon was because Bob wanted to look at trees on the north coast of Spain to see whether they have more veteran attributes or not. And, then, and that work from Chillingham came up in the discussions. We've never met that. Right. <laughs> so, did he ever report back to you on, on that? Well, the thing was published. No, uh, the, 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 no, no, I never heard about that. Oh, right. that. But at the time, Bob had a natural influence on the project to go like around Europe to uh, measure veteran trees. So the, idea, the hypothesis was that England has more veteran trees yeah. than Europe. Yeah. And so he surveyed some in, in England and then a stratified random across Europe with Mike Smith. And that never got, uh, it was a research note for natural England, but never got published as a paper. Right. And recently someone else published a paper that was done in, in England. That had the exact same estimates that Bob came up with. Bob never published his work. Uh, <laughs> and they didn't even right. reference his work because they couldn't find the natural England paper because it's gone into obscure, obscurity. As they do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, I just wondered, uh, Stephen, what, what the status is of bracken if you have it in the, in the thing and, that, and whether you have any sycamore and what's that doing when you don't have any sycamore? Um, bracken and sycamore. Um, well, you things are only going to survive the grazing of the cattle and the fallow deer that we have if they are protected and we've um, we have planted some sycamore but very few um, that's because it's seen as, uh, as um, a decoy for the gray squirrels which sadly we have and which we're getting very grumpy about and because we're trying to favor the reds that we have but we have a limited number of reds um, there are sycamores that were planted um, as landscape feature trees, and um, they're very, they've been very durable. They don't have veteran features, basically, but some of them are that old. They're actually on the 25-inch Ordnance Survey map from 1890. So sycamore, yeah. Bracken, well, we've been doing a lot of bracken bashing. We, we actually go over it and, and knock it all down, and um, that's, that, that, um, that, that clearly brings more light into the situation. But um, it hasn't really shown up yet in these statistical approaches. 
we, we top it as well, I should say. The, whole, the, the accessible pastures are topped um, in, in about, um, you know, well, it'd be a bit earlier than now, but not much. One other, one other question, which is the magnesium deficiency in the cattle, which obviously would be coming through from the vegetation in the soil, would that, do you think, be related to acid rain? Because if like, the system has lasted for centuries without really much input, so it suggests some, some environmental driver that was causing the change. Um, you mean in the, in the magnesium intake? In the, well, yeah. quite possibly. I mean, if you look at the nitrogen deposition map, Chevius has got a lot of nitrogen on it. Um, there's a certain amount there. Um, there's so many other factors come into it. Um, and you didn't, um, since you didn't, you didn't mention um, phenology and timing of reproductive events. But if you take a mean, these things breed all year round, and that's very unusual for a mammal. It means you can now look at the effect of, of phenology in something that doesn't come up against a hormonal barrier to start in breeding. Now, the average, if, you, if that's meaningful, the average date of birth in 1950 was July. It's now May. So, and there's a load of jiggling about for year to year because of the vastly variable um, numbers you get when you've only got 20, at the most, cows breeding in a year. But um, it's quite clear there is an advance of one day per year, presumably as a result of an earlier a spring crush. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, the final presentation of the morning is Stephen Warnock, again coming to talk about the character of the landscape. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Set that, set just the set buttons those there. buttons yeah, there, yeah. Fine. Okay. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, just to say where I combined from a ge geological training to start with, that's my background, but then moved to do an MSc in landscape ecology because I was getting more and more interested in wildlife and so on to give me that, that characteristic. And following that course, I spent a year working up at Merle Roof with Bob Bunce. I came up to do some farmer interview surveys, but stayed on there for a number of contracts during that, that, that year, and um, which was great. And I think it's, it's that work with, uh, I remember one thing that really sticks in my mind with Bob and so keen the species, obviously we had a bit of training for some of those, those surveys we did. We're looking at um, kilometer square quadrats and so on, and relating those to satellite images and the vegetation and so on. But I remember one day up in a, a, a steep slope, squeeze slope up into a rock, looking at some Arctic alpines, and he was identifying some of the, the one of those species, indicator species. And I remember it was fascinating. We were caught up with all the things he was showing. And then I suddenly looked around and thought, crikey. We were, there was a wind blowing in the, the rain in sideways through us, you know, to the back of us, into the rock, and he just turned around and hit you in the face. But we hadn't really noticed that because we've been so engaged in what he was saying about the plants and what they meant. And I think it's that link is using plants as a measure of the wider, what's happening in the wider landscape, as indicators, as it were. Certain plants tell you certain things about soils and everything underneath that. I think that's where he got that from him. And that's what I built into. I then went on to working to, to describing landscapes with the geological, the ecology, and then the historical side, putting it together to identify different types of landscape in which species can live. So what I've just done is for this area is just to show that how you can break it down, how you look at it. Because it's obviously a map of, of the area of Grange over Sands in the center. You can see here in Merlewood, I just mapped a little symbol, you can see in all the maps, just where it is. So it's just in, in that sort of area, quite a diverse area of roads, the pattern, old, old pattern roads and so on. So it's quite an ancient landscape. Well, the woodlands, obviously the greens, and you can see the contrast topography. Mm -hmm. So how do you understand that landscape? I think it's trying to look at the underlying, the topography, the soil, geology and soils, because that's the bedrock for everything that, that's up and above that. So we'll just go through. The first thing to look at, if you just take all the things off and 